and welcome to uh, another episode of Keeping London Healthy. My name is uh, Dr. Mario Elia, and I'm a family doctor here in London. Uh, for today's episode, uh, again, we're going to do another you know, non-COVID talk, and we're going to be addressing a question I've been getting a lot from patients uh, and their families, uh, especially as we're coming, coming out, of, um, out, of, out of the spring and, and uh, into the fall. You know, what do we need to see our doctor for? You know, if you haven't seen your doctor in many months, people have questions, do I need a physical um, should I be going in to see them? Should I be calling them? So we're going to address a few of the uh, kind of common uh, subjects um, that I want you to be thinking about and thinking about your own health and how that kind of relates and whether you should be reaching out to your, to your health professional. And we'll be doing it by age group. So very briefly, we're going to start talking about kids. Um, but next uh, next month, we're actually going to be doing an entire episode just about um, pediatrics and, and what kind of uh, follow-up uh, kids will be needed. So we're going to touch on it really briefly today. Uh, but next month, we're going to be doing a, a, a much deeper dive into pediatrics. After that, we're going to be hitting on kind of young and middle-aged adults, kind of what things to be looking at uh, for their health. And then at the end, um, we're going to be dealing with older adults. Okay, so uh, a lot of exciting things. And hopefully, the information you get today, you'll be able to share with, with um, friends and family uh, to make sure that they're uh, keeping uh, on top of their own health. So we'll start with kids first. So um, if your kid has not seen a, a physician, I, I would describe kid as all the way up to 18. Um, if your child has not seen a physician in the past year, at the very least, they should be seeing a physician once every year, at least for a weight check, um, for anyone to and above, a blood pressure check, a review of immunizations, because obviously, depending on their, their age, immunizations um, will be important. Uh, one thing for parents to know that we the childhood immunizations, there's a schedule from two months right to four years. After they get their four to six year immunization, there's nothing else that's scheduled until uh, grade seven. Okay, so if your kid is in that kind of nine, 10 age group and has had all their shots, you don't have to worry about, about shots. You can check in with the doctor just to make sure. But again, between that four to six age group and that grade seven time frame, there's no real routine shots. There's their flu shots and, and whatnot, but but nothing nothing routine. So again, once a year check for blood pressure, um, make sure their immunizations are up to date, uh, get a weight check. Those are the things we're advising most in kids. But again, next month, we're going to do a deep dive into things uh, that parents need to be aware of uh, for their child's health. So next, we'll go into uh, young adults and, and middle-aged adults. And, and, and what, you know, what should you be doing regularly? So let's start broadly with, you know, do, what about the, the physical, right? You know, in years past, we've been used to going into our doctor, um, you know, stripping down half naked, getting up on the bed and, and, and uh, then checking us over. You know, do we, do we still do this anymore and do we still need it? Well, the answer is the, the, the physical as we used to do, where we would listen to your heart, listen to your lungs and, you know, tell you to say, ah, that we don't do as, uh, you know, as routinely anymore because there's not good evidence to support that for routine care. But that's been replaced with something we call a periodic health exam or a periodic health review. Those are the terms you'll hear about. So the purposes of those is, you know, again, once a year, kind of going through and making sure that all of the health topics that are important are being addressed, because that there's evidence for, you know, listening to someone's heart and lungs and, you know, feeling their neck and kind of doing that uh, whole song and dance. There's not actually a lot of good evidence to support that if you're not having any symptoms, but going through topic by topic is really important. So we'll, we'll again, we'll address this right now with young adults and middle-aged adults. What should you be asking for? You know, what's part of that periodic health review? So a few things. Number one is a weight. Okay, obviously we want to see kind of what your weight has been. Has it fluctuated over time? Is it up? Is it down? Anything to be worried about there? Number two, and this is the biggie, blood pressure. Okay, um, the reason is that most people with high blood pressure have no idea they have high blood pressure. And I'm seeing this particularly through, through the pandemic, but even earlier on, especially young people have no idea that their blood pressure is elevated because why would they know? They feel fine. They're not having any symptoms. They're going about their daily life and their blood pressure actually is quite elevated. So I usually advise everyone, even if you've never been diagnosed with high blood pressure and have no reason to get it checked, check it at least once a year to make sure we're not missing high blood pressure over time. And for someone without any symptoms, with no other risk factors, anything, you know, an average blood pressure above 140 over 90 really should be, um, uh, should be getting uh, seen by a physician. Okay, so we talked about weight, talk about blood pressure. Uh, number three, uh, immunization review. So again, for, for most young adults, they've had all their childhood ones, they had their grade seven shots, they had uh, maybe a tetanus booster later, but making sure they're up to date with that. If they're not in a monogamous relationship, thinking about the HPV vaccine, because we know HPV um, can increase risk of uh, tonsil cancer, 
cervical cancer, penile cancer, and genital warts. So again, if someone is still potentially uh, at risk of getting new HPV strains exposed to them, uh, getting the, the HPV vaccine is a good idea. Um, another big thing with young adults that we've kind of um, kind of missed through a lot of this pandemic is STI screening. Okay, so that's urine screen for chlamydia and gonorrhea, that's blood testing for HIV and syphilis. Um, and again, what I what I usually tell patients is any any site that you've been 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 um, sexually active, so whether that's or, oral sex, vaginal sex, uh, what have you, um, that should be tested. And again, that that's as simple as calling up uh, uh, your your physician, or or if you don't have a physician, go to a walk-in clinic, and they can easily get get get, uh, get checked for that. And I recommend getting STI testing with any new sexual partner. That's usually my recommendation. So again, if if we've been neg negligent and it's been a year and a half and you've not gotten STI testing, and don't hesitate to reach out to your physician about that. Then we've got the things like nutrition and exercise, right, which are brought up during our period periodic health reviews. And I know we touched a lot about that uh, last visit. So that, that's often part of that discussion. Uh, cancer screening. So again, the young middle-aged um, uh, group, what, can, what cancer screening is available? So for, for women, we do pap, pap, pap tests. You've often heard of this. So that's a test for cervical cancer. So the cervix is the bottom part of the uterus. That's what we're testing when we, when we do a pap smear. So cervical uh, cancer screening or pap tests start in women, at, uh, women or those with a uterus at age uh, 25. Years ago, it was 18. That's when, they, and then it became 21. And now the evidence is starting at age 25. So if you're, if you know someone who's 25 or you just turned 25, make sure they're aware of the importance of pap testing. And we do pap tests every three years. Okay, so every three years from 25 right up until age 70 is usually the age group that we do pap tests on. If someone has an abnormal pap, we do them more frequently. If they've had a previous abnormal pap, then they might need it more frequently too. Their physician will advise them about that. But all else being equal, if paps are all normal, making sure every three years you're getting those done regularly. Okay, so that's 25 right to 70. And that's for females. Um, the other kind of female uh, cancer screening, obviously, is breast cancer screening. And that, uh, for most women, will start at age 50 right to age 75. Uh, now, why 50? Again, depends on the country, but again, in Ontario, it's it's 50. If you have a family history, that's where things become a bit different. We want you to get a pap, uh, sorry, a mammogram done 10 years before your first year relative had breast cancer. So if uh, you, you had a, a mother with breast cancer at 49, um, again, no other risk factors, no BRCA testing, you know, you want it at least 10 years before. Um, that's usually when we start um, screening in those age groups. So again, that, that's um, for low-risk women every two years for their mammogram. For high-risk women, meaning women who've had previous breast cancer or family history, they'd be doing every year. Okay, And then why 75? Well, um, 75 is just a routine, but if someone is otherwise, you know, very, very healthy and they they get to 76 and they and they tell me that, you know, they'd want a mammogram because if they were to have breast cancer, they would still want to treat it. Then we would still consider as part of a discussion whether they, they should continue with, with mammograms. But again, that's part of the discussion we would have with those patients. But the routine is 50 to 75, okay? The other, there's three main cancers we screen for in Ontario. The third is colon cancer screening. So uh, it used to be the FOBT kit, the fecal occult blood test, where you used to do these three poops. Um, three straight days, he used to smear it on a card and then he used to mail it off. That's changed now to a FIT test, so a fecal immunochemical test, which is um, which is only one smear, one day. So you basically, you, you poop, you take a little stick, you smear it on the poop, you smear it on the kit, you, you put it together and you mail it off. Um, and that's one, one kit once. And they tell you whether you have microscopic blood, because because if you do, then that would warrant a colonoscopy. So that's done between age 50 and 75 every two years is what the fit, how often the fit tests are done. And those are in low risk individuals. So again, no family history of cancer, no personal history of polyps or cancer or anything like that. That's, they would be getting the fit testing done. Okay. Now, if you do have a family history of colon cancer or family history of polyps, or you've had polyps, then you would be getting a colonoscopy at certain intervals. But for everyone else, um, we would be doing this this fit testing, and it's shown it's been shown to be effective in in in, um, in picking up uh, early uh, colon cancers. So those are the main ones. Other skin cancers that you may hear about being being screened for, you know, skin cancers. If you've had a previous history of melanoma, you should be getting checked over by your doctor once a year, or any other non-melanoma skin cancers. Probably once a year with your doctor is probably reasonable. In people without a, fa a personal or family history of skin cancer. Uh, I don't necessarily insist that they come in for a check. You know, if, if, they, if they're if they single and live alone and they can't see their back, for instance, 
I think it's probably reasonable to ask your doctor just to take a quick peek at your back to make sure you have no skin lesions. Um, but for anyone else who doesn't, they don't see anything obvious on their body that they're concerned about and they're low risk, we don't necessarily insist that they see a doctor for it. Uh, lung cancer screening is something you're going to be seeing in the next a few years. Um, that's being rolled out in Ontario quite slowly, but for people who have a previous smoking history, there is going to be a program for yearly CT scans for lung cancer screening, so watch for that. And then in the next few uh, months, I believe we're going to be doing a whole uh, a whole episode about prostate cancer screening. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. It's fairly uh, fairly controversial. There's a lot to, to to unpack, but we're going to be talking about prostate screen prostate cancer screening at um, at a later visit. Okay. Um, other things for kind of young middle age group uh, to keep in mind. So again, we often talk about uh, habits. So what's going on with alcohol use? What's going on with smoking? What's going on with other drugs? Um, and having a conversation about their readiness to potentially deal with some of these habits to reduce to to uh, to, to deal with those. Um, and uh, lastly, in that kind of young middle age group, uh, the importance of contraception. Um, to make sure we're having a conversation. Um, has you know are they are they in a, are they in a relationship? What are their plans for kids? And making sure that we have a conversation about about uh, contraception if if they have no desire to have children in the near future. So those are some things that we will talk about kind of with that with that age group as part of their periodic health review. The, the other one would be blood work because um, I have people ask me all the time. You know, doc, am I due for blood work? And the answer is. Um, if someone's low risk, the, the only blood work that they really need in that young to middle age group, um, they'll need a cholesterol level every five years or so, and then a, a sugar level to make sure they're not diabetic every three years or so. That's Those are the common ones, um, really starting at 40-ish, unless they have other risk factors. So if they're obese, potentially we'll, we'll, we'll start checking earlier. But for otherwise average, average risk group, we'll do the cholesterol and sugar starting at age 40. Um, cholesterol every five years, sugar every, every three years, um, and nothing else really. Like we don't check your uh, iron level and things like this unless you're having symptoms, in which case we, we definitely do need to check it. Uh, and then lastly, it makes sure they've seen a dentist at least once a year and make sure they've seen an optometrist. So that kind of rounds out all the things we would talk about um, at a periodic health review. So again, if you're up to date on all those things, great. You probably don't actually need to see your doctor. Um, if you're due for one or one or more of those, uh, obviously don't hesitate to give, give them a shout and they'd be happy to do uh, to, to help you out. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about older adults. Welcome back. Uh, now we're going to move on to older adults. So again, uh, older adults I'll, I'll define as 65 plus, um, and we'll go right up to right up to 100 essentially. And talking about you know what kind of things that we want to make sure that you're you're remembering to talk about your doctor and bringing up if you have concerns about. So um, similar to the, the younger age group, you know, STI screens is probably relevant for for some older adults depending on uh, depending on their lifestyle. Uh, blood work, same screening uh, interval for diabetes and, and cholesterol. Um, as you you know, as you get older and you start developing certain medical issues, uh, whether it be blood pressure or or diabetes or, or or what have you, you'll need blood work catered for that specific illness. And we're not, obviously not going to go over every uh, chronic disease here, but if you're on a medication through your doctor, um, probably not a bad idea to reach out just to make sure that there's no yearly blood work or more frequent that 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 uh, you're you're due for. Um, generally, doctors have been keeping up with this along, but if you have if you're on a medication and haven't had any blood work done in the last year. Probably not a bad idea to reach out about that. Uh, immunizations. So, um, you know, the, the relevant immunizations for the 65 plus age group would be the pneumonia vaccine. So this is called Pneumovax. It's covered through OHIP. It's a, a one-off vaccine for the majority of people um, given at 65. And that's basically for most people, the only one we give pneumonia one, uh, sorry, the only pneumonia vaccine we give for life. There's another vaccine available called Prevnar. Um, I, I, it's available. It's not uh, publicly funded. Um, I, I have conversations with patients that that is an option, but in terms of kind of what I, I encourage most strongly with patients, it'll be the, the Pneumovax 23. Uh, other immunizations to talk to think about would be the shingles vaccine. So there used to be a shingles vaccine called Zostavax many years ago, um, and that was found to be 50% effective in reducing the risk of shingles uh, per year. Um, now there's a vaccine called Shingrix, um, which is 90% effective in reducing the risk of shingles. That's a two-dose series uh, given um, 
at zero time point and two to six months after your first dose. Um, again, quite effective in reducing the risk of shingles, side effects, sore arm, kind of feeling fluey for a day or two. Um, the downside of the back to the shingles vaccine, um, honestly, is cost. Uh, it's a few hundred dollars uh, for the for the dosing. So, um, depending on on your financial situation, uh, that might be something that that uh, you would consider, um, because obviously we do see the uh, the, the the harm in shingles uh, with the um, with the pain associated with it, and sometimes the uh, the lingering symptoms. So again, something to be talking about with your physician. Now that we've kind of gone through and had our COVID shots and we don't have to worry about timing, we can kind of get back into talking about some of these other vaccines. Cancer screening, again, same as young and middle-aged adults. So um, uh, uh, sorry, breast cancer screening, uh, pap tests up to age 70, colon cancer screening, those things are still, still relevant. Um, one, one test that we start doing at 65, most people is a bone density, it's called. So it's a series of x-rays that are done to see what's, uh, the, the, the density of someone's bones and to see whether they have normal bones or whether they are closer to osteoporosis. So it's done, um, it's done at starting at 65. So if you're 65 and over, you've never had a bone density, you should probably reach out to your physician about that. And then the interval is just dependent on how good your bones are. So if you have excellent bones, your next bone density could be up to 10 years after your, after your first one. If it's not so good, it might be three to five years. So it just depends. But at, at the very least, if you're 65 and over, and especially female, females have higher risk of osteoporosis. For males in my practice, sometimes I actually push it to 75, sometimes even 80, because they are, are a much lower risk for osteoporosis. But certainly if you're a female 65 and over, you need at least one bone, bone density to be done. Switching to males a little bit. So we talk about aneurysm screening. So there's something, um, there's a condition called an abdominal aneurysm, which is a, basically a, a, a widening of, uh, of your aorta. So your, your, your heart and you have your aorta that comes from the heart and comes down um, and into the belly and it kind of supplies blood to your legs and to all your, all your organs. And that aorta can be ballooned sometimes. Risk factors for that would be smoking, blood pressure, age is a big one. So what we normally recommend is in males 65 to, to, to 70, 65 to, seven, to 75, that they have a one-time ultrasound of their aorta to make sure that they don't have an aneurysm. Okay. Um, so again, why males? Males much higher risk for aneurysm than, than females. If it's a female in that age group with a history of smoking or a history of heart disease or stroke, they might be somebody who should talk to their physician about getting an aneurysm as well. We know aneurysm rates have come way down since people are smoking less than they used to, but still we want to make sure that we're keeping up with this. Um, so again, that's males 65 to 75 and females 65 to 75 if they smoke or have vascular disease. Okay, so that's aneurysm screening. Another couple things, um, especially as we get older, so not, you know, 65, yeah, but especially as you get in your 70s and 80s, we start having conversations about falls screening. So making sure that um, patients aren't having repeated falls so that either the family or friends are concerned about uh, them falling, um, because we know that's a huge risk factor um, for, 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 Injuries like fractures and, and of, the, of the hip and the back, um, hematomas of the, the brain. So we want to make sure people aren't falling. So making sure we're asking about that, asking about driving safety. It's obviously a touchy subject for many, um, but we want to make sure at least bringing it up because we want to make sure that that um, we're we're not having unsafe drivers on the road. And as part of that, asking again family. Um, spouse, children, about cognition. So have you noticed any issues with memory, either themselves or their family, have they noticed any issues? And we can do some screening, some tests around that to make sure that, um, that they don't have any signs of kind of early dementia or what we call mild cognitive impairment. So we can do tests for that as well. Um, we would ask about the same habit stuff. So alcohol and smoking, it's never too late to address these things. Even if someone smoked for 60 years, um, you know, I, I have patients who, who, who drink, who develop some memory issues, and that's the time that they finally decide to stop uh, drinking alcohol is heavy. So again, there's never, there's never a time too late to, to cut back on these, on these habits uh, and to reverse things. Um, the dentist, the optometrist, making sure that they're seeing them regularly as well, nutrition and exercise, same kind of things. Um, and then lastly, uh, we want to touch on something called advanced care planning. So, you know, what that is, is making sure that, that we're having a conversation with seniors about, you know, what would they want done in certain medical situations, um, whether that be hospital, whether that be treatments for certain things, we want to make sure that they're, they're in control and that they're driving and, and that their, their wishes are, are listened to. So what, what that involves is, you know, who is their power of attorney for, for personal care, for finances? Is that established? Is there a will in place? And, that for, and then the other piece of this is, you know, would they want um, 
CPR done? You know, would they want uh, certain things done in the hospital? Would they want certain uh, breathing tubes or feeding tubes? Or, you know, what would make life not worth living for them at certain pieces? So these are difficult conversations, obviously, but the conversations we want to have so that we're not making assumptions about what they would want or what they wouldn't want have done. Um, so, you know, how do we start these conversations? So, so yes, you know, Physicians like myself can initiate those conversations, but there's a great resource uh, online that I really encourage patients to take, take a peek at. It's advancedcareplanning.ca. We'll put a link on, on the bottom here. Um, but I really encourage not only seniors, but if you have parents who are seniors, please go to this website, please print off uh, the workbook, uh, go through it with them, because you'll find that this opens up conversations and, and makes you aware of certain things, certain witches they have that you may not have you may not have assumed, right? You may have assumed something else in terms of what they would, would have wanted. And to have these conversations out there and, and to know what they want will, will save a lot of heartache later on. You know, I can't tell you how many patients I've had um, who've ended up sick in the hospital, um, sadly unable to communicate their wishes and family have no idea what, whether they would have wanted um, X done or Y done. or uh, so, so again, having these conversations in advance is so, so important. Um, yeah, so that's, that takes care of all the uh, older adults and uh, what we'd want. A couple other things just to keep in mind um, with what we'll call specialized populations. So um, patients with diabetes, in, a, again, in an episode, I think in a couple months, we're going to be uh, having an endocrinologist on to talk a lot about diabetes care and, and things to be aware of. But, you know, very briefly, if you do have diabetes, we, we probably want you seeing your doctor. Um, probably every three to six months in most cases. Again, if you and your cl clinician have arranged a different, um, a different arrangement, defaults, whatever they've said, of course. Um, but for most, we want blood work every three to six months. If you're super stable, then maybe every 12 months. Um, but I generally like to see my diabetes patients every three to six months. For what? For blood work. Uh, to check their, uh, we call it a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, we like to do a blood pressure. Uh, once a year, we like to check the sensation on the bottom of their feet. Um, make sure they've seen the optometrist yearly. So again, just some housekeeping things we want to make sure we're keeping on track of with our patients with diabetes. If you're on blood pressure medications or other medications for your heart, making sure you've had blood work probably done in the last year is not unreasonable. And then lastly, if you're on thyroid medications, uh, making sure you've had blood work done at least once a year is what we generally recommend. So again, default to whatever your clinician says. Again, this episode is not a uh, replacement for uh, for advice from your own a healthcare practitioner, but these are just some general guidelines that I like to use with uh, with my patients. So um, we'll take a quick break and we'll be right back after these messages. Welcome back. So again, hopefully you found uh, today's advice useful, uh, regardless of, of what age category you're in and, and gave you some food for thought uh, for things to bring up with uh, with your physician. And again, if you're up to date on everything, great. Um, you don't necessarily need to come in for your uh, for your periodic health review. Uh, so in future months, we're as I mentioned, we're going to be addressing uh, diabetes, uh, pediatrics, uh, prostate cancer screening. So we've got a, a few exciting episodes coming up in the next few months. Uh, one quick update with COVID I wanted to, to, uh, to provide. Uh, so today is, we're taping this on August 9th. What we're seeing is, on, you know, uh, perhaps not surprisingly, case counts starting to go up just a little bit. So I'm going to give a plug in once again for vaccinations. Um, now is the time if you're on the fence, we want to make sure you're giving it a good six weeks to get those two doses in. I don't want people scrambling as we approach September and October. And if you're getting symptoms, if you have any symptoms of COVID, even if you've been fully vaccinated, make sure you get tested. I'm not sure if you can hear, but I'm a bit under the weather myself today. A um, bit of a runny nose. Uh, so I did get COVID tested yesterday and thankfully I am negative. Um, but again, just highlights the importance of still getting tested. Um, we're seeing a lot more viruses spreading, of course, uh, as people get together. I'm seeing a lot more of this in the last few weeks than I did probably for the last year, non-COVID viruses. So I know it's frustrating when you get a runny nose, having to run off and get a COVID test each time. But it is important because when people do have COVID, we want to make sure we're identifying them and taking the, uh, the the proper steps. So again, don't forget to get tested. And please, 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 if you are still on the fence with vaccinating, uh, now is going to be a, a good time to do it because we want to give your body enough time by mid-September to, to be immune. And what we're seeing in the States, unfortunately, is a lot of unvaccinated people ending up in the hospital um, with regrets about their decision. And I, 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 I do not want to see our, our friends and neighbors here in London uh, suffer, suffer a similar fate. So on that note, um, have a great, uh, have a great month guys. And we'll see you back next month for another episode. Take care.